Well, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. Uh, John chapter 1. So John 1, and we'll be reading from verse 35 through the end of the chapter. Now the next day, again, John, that is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus and as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Uh, will you pray with me now? Lord God Almighty, we thank you that the words that we have just read are living words, truthful words, are transformative words. And so, Father, just as we have sung, so now we ask, Lord, that you would come by your Holy Spirit, that you would take the words that you have written and Lord, that you would use them to draw us nearer and nearer to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that just like these disciples, that we too might meet Jesus now. And that meeting Jesus, we might be changed from one degree of glory to another. So please come, Lord. Uh, overcome our unbelief, overcome the distractions around us, and speak living words to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this passage that we've just read together is all about uh, ordinary, normal people who meet Jesus and what they think of him. A number of years ago now, uh, I met a fellow uh, who thought he was God. It was um, back six or seven years ago when we lived in Dunedin, and I was doing prison ministry, and I think his name was John. It was a very uh, interesting conversation. And so I started talking to him, and it turned out that maybe a year prior to uh, meeting me, uh, he had come to the conclusion, uh, presumably while high on something, uh, that he himself was God. And as a result, uh, he told his girlfriend that she was to bow down before him. And needless to say, that didn't go too well. 
and after a string of other events that he did as God, uh, he ended up behind bars. But what was quite interesting was when I met this fellow, I think John was his name, it was quite interesting that none of the other inmates uh, bowed down to him in reverence. Uh, Not one of them uh, seemed to give him the reverence he thought he was due. In fact, even John himself, by this point, was starting to doubt his own divinity. And what's quite interesting about it is that in our passage, we've got another man of whom lofty claims have been made. Right in the passage before, the, if you were here last week, uh, John the Baptist has made the just as staggering claims that actually this human, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, is the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the very Son of God. And now we get to see uh, actually what ordinary, normal people, just like us, uh, think of him. And the three lessons that the Lord has for each of us this morning from this passage in front of us, and the first message that the Lord has for you and for me is that meeting Jesus changes everything. Meeting Jesus changes everything. So if you are here with us last week, uh, we thought about John the Baptist being like a signpost uh, that points the way to Jesus. And now in this passage, as it were, we get to see what happens uh, when people follow that signpost, uh, what they find. So we're not going to retell the story as we've just read it together, but I'm sure you picked up as we read through it uh, that there's this kind of reoccurring pattern uh, that people meet Jesus. Uh, People are persuaded that Jesus is who he says he is, and then they go and tell other people. And so the first point that I really want you to take notice of in this passage is that in each case, the decisive turning point comes as people meet Jesus. The decisive decisive turning point is as people meet Jesus individually and personally. So it wasn't enough that John told his disciples about Jesus. It wasn't enough that Andrew told Simon Peter about Jesus. It wasn't enough that Philip told Nathaniel about Jesus. And actually, it won't be enough when you tell other people around you about Jesus. But in each case, the only way that hearts are changed, or the only way that resistance is overcome, is actually through meeting Jesus for yourself. I mean, that's what we see in these verses, isn't it? That actually, it's only as these two disciples of John uh, meet with Jesus and spend time with him, that we hear coming from their lips, uh, we have found the Messiah. Same with Philip, same with Nathaniel. That actually it was encountering the living Lord Jesus that changed everything. You see, the final apologetic or the final proof of Christianity isn't actually a rational argument. It isn't actually uh, normally the overcoming of a doubt. But actually, it's meeting the Lord Jesus Christ. It's coming to know him, having an encounter with the living Christ that leaves you changed. You see, for Nathaniel, you might have picked up, uh, there was at least some resistance uh, when he first heard it. If you glance your eyes over verse 46, uh, Philip has just told him, uh, we have found the Messiah, uh, the one we've been waiting for, God's promised king. And look how he responds in verse 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I quite like how the Message Bible paraphrases this. It says, "Uh, Nazareth, you've got to be kidding me. (laughs) Right, it didn't fit. This wasn't the place where God's promised Messiah was supposed to come from. It just didn't seem to fit. It might be similar to maybe if you imagine uh, that you found out there was a closet billionaire living in New Zealand, and you found that he chose to live in Huntley or in Manukau. No offence whatsoever to any living in Huntley or Manukau. But it just wouldn't seem to fit, would it? Uh, It wouldn't seem quite right. But notice how Philip uh, responds. If you look down at the latter half of verse 46... 
Philip said to him, come and see. Come and meet him for yourself. Uh, Then tell me what you think. And maybe our evangelism should look a little bit more like that sometimes. Come and see. You see, Nathaniel meets the living Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells him things about himself that no human could reasonably know. And the only conclusion left to him is, in fact, that this must be the very Son of God. If you look at verse 40. Uh, 9, Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And surely that's meant to be suggestive. That actually people come to faith as they encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. As it were, we point the way, but only he can change them. You see, nothing short of an encounter with the living Christ is enough to overcome the resistance of sinful hearts. See, here in this passage in front of us, we see five ordinary people who meet Jesus. Uh, Andrew and the other disciple of John, uh, Peter, Philip, and then Nathaniel. And not one of them thinks he's just a mad hatter. Not one of them thinks he's just off his nut. No, actually, every single one of them comes to the same persuasion that this is none other than the very Son of God. In each case, as they meet Jesus, they're persuaded. This is the one we've been waiting for. It might be a little bit like, uh, if you imagine with me, uh, that a friend came up to you, and they said something to the effect of, uh, have you heard that a new Korean barbecue restaurant has just opened up in Botany? And it's delicious, superb. Uh, You've got to try it. And you might think to yourself, "Uh, well, that's just your opinion. You probably don't even know what you're talking about. But then if over the next week, person after person said the exact same thing to you, you've got to try it. We tried it, and it was amazing. Uh, It becomes more and more weighty. There becomes a weight of witness that actually means it's probably worth a try, probably worth you going and trying for yourself. You see, in this passage, if you think about some of the basic claims that it makes, it makes a claim that Jesus knows things about people that only God could know. Everyone who meets Jesus in this passage is persuaded that he is none other than the messianic son of God, And in fact, they're all so persuaded that having met him, they feel compelled to go and bring their nearest and dearest to him. And so actually this morning, if you're not yet persuaded uh, that Jesus is indeed who he says he is, uh, then maybe it's because you haven't uh, encountered him yet. And maybe others have told you things about Jesus, uh, but maybe you've never actually uh, encountered him personally. In the case of the Korean barbecue, there might come a point where you'd have to decide, actually, the only way I'm really going to know if this is as good as everyone's saying is actually if I go and try it for myself. If I go along and order whatever I order and see for myself if it's as good as they're saying. And really, in a sense, that's the invitation of this passage to each one of us, that the same words Jesus addressed to his disciples Actually, he addresses to each and every one of us this morning. Are you not yet persuaded that Jesus is who he says he is? Then come and see. Come and spend some time with him. Come and spend time with him uh, by gathering with his people here, his church. Come and spend time with him by reading his word and asking for the illumination of his spirit. Come and encounter the living Christ by crying out to him in prayer. You see, if it's not real, you lose nothing but time. But if it is real, uh, then actually you gain everything. So the first lesson that we learn from this passage is that actually meeting Jesus changes everything. That it's only as you meet Jesus personally and authentically that resistance fades 
and disciples of Jesus are made. And the next lesson we see from these verses is that those who find Jesus find others. Those who find Jesus find others. And again, I'm sure as we read through these verses, uh, you picked up this pattern. Uh, that those who find Jesus uh, then go and find others and bring them to Jesus. So this passage is about Jesus finding people through his people. Now, of course, we do have to be somewhat careful here. And we do have to be aware that actually uh, the men in this chapter, uh, they weren't merely becoming generic followers of Jesus, but they were actually becoming some of the 12 disciples. They were called to be apostles. Uh, You're not. But part of uh, the pattern here seems to be that actually, although there is something distinct, yet actually it rings true for the way that Jesus calls all of his disciples. So in our verses, if you look down with me, you see this pattern again and again. Uh, John sees that Jesus is the Messiah, and so he tells his disciples. Uh, Andrew sees, and so he tells his brother Peter. Philip sees, and so he goes and finds Nathaniel. That as a result of being with him, are they convinced that they've found something of great worth, something that is so good uh, that actually it deserves to be spread? Right? Because that's what you do when you find something precious or something valuable. Uh, you tell other people, and maybe on a somewhat mundane level, uh, if I find uh, a book that I've really enjoyed, or a movie that I've loved, or a coffee shop that I really like, uh, one of the first things that I'll often do is I'll tell my brother about them. And I'll be like, you should try them. They were so good. I found them to be good, and so I want you to share in that good. And really that's part of the idea here. That actually finding Jesus is never a merely private event. It can't be. Right? The Christian faith is necessarily a, mini- a missional faith. Right? Those who find Jesus find others. And so at least one application that seems to be safe to make is that actually the very normal call of Scripture is that those who find Jesus, encounter him, are persuaded that he is who he says he is, uh, go and find others. That come and see becomes go and tell. Right? That's the basic convicting pattern of both Scripture and church history. That actually the church grows as ordinary, normal Christians stumble their way along trying to tell other people about Jesus. I recently heard of a convert in one of our neighbouring churches, and he came over to New Zealand as a political refugee from Iran, and he met Jesus, and he was converted. And he went and told his mum and dad in Iran, and they became Christians. And then he went and told his uh, his wife, and his children. And they became Christians. And then he began to travel up and down New Zealand, sharing the faith with Muslims and trying to share the precious news he had found with them. But I do want to be honest here. It seldom feels that simple, does it? And in fact, probably most of you, are like me, already feel guilty about this. Uh, You already feel that you should be doing this, but you find it really hard. Uh, You're afraid. Maybe maybe even you've tried to do this. But instead of of a success story, it was just awkward and embarrassing. Uh, Your Andrew moment didn't go quite as smoothly as his did. Uh, You told your friend or your brother about Jesus, and they weren't converted in a moment, but instead it just meant a kind of awkward, strained relationship with them. Now this is how the British evangelist uh, Rico Tice described his experience of becoming a Christian. Uh, He said, I had come to faith in Jesus. 
And I thought, this is wonderful. And so I told other people around me, and they promptly told me that it wasn't wonderful at all. (laughs) And he reflected on it in this way. He said, most people don't like the gospel. Sometimes they express it politely. Other times not politely at all. But they don't like it. So if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you're going to get hurt. Now, there's a pain line to be crossed if I tell others about the gospel. And I wonder if that actually resonates with your own experience. Now, that actually often you have maybe been hurt. Now, that you've tried to share the gospel, but it hasn't been always wonderfully rewarding, but often it's just been painful and quite uncomfortable. And actually, to be honest, that's fairly normal. Right? Jesus describes evangelism as like uh, being sheep among wolves. And so there is a pain line if we're going to share the gospel with the world around us. But those who find Jesus find others. And our third lesson that the Lord has for us is that Jesus is heaven opened for us. Jesus is heaven opened for us. So if you look down to our last couple of verses and um, at the end of John 1, and Nathaniel's just made his great confession. And then Jesus said to him in verse 50, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than this. And Jesus is effectively saying, Oh, this is nothing. You're persuaded because I saw you under the fig tree? Oh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the bare beginning of what you're going to see. And actually what we see in the Gospel of John. Now you might have picked up that in the very last verse, he uses that very characteristic, truly, truly, or very truly if you've got an NIV. And that's a very important phrase in John. Whenever you hear that, truly, truly, uh, perk up. Because God has got something important that he's about to say. If you read it with me, uh, verse 51, And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And of course, this is a direct quotation from those verses that Reuben read for us from Genesis 28. That Jacob was at Bethel, he had a dream, and in his dream he saw a ladder connecting heaven and earth with angels ascending and descending upon it. And now the very first words in John's Gospel that Jesus says about himself is actually saying that he himself is that ladder. That actually he is the very point of connection between heaven and earth. That he's a stairway to heaven that Led Zeppelin couldn't see. Uh, It's quite interesting when Jacob wakes up from his dream in the Genesis account. And it says there, uh, this was his response afterward. He said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And it's quite illuminating if you take the word Jesus and you put it in that verse in the place of this or this place, which seems very fair to do on the basis of our passage. And then it reads like this. It reads, surely the Lord is in Jesus, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is Jesus. Jesus is none other than the house of God, and Jesus is the gate of heaven. Right, that's the point, isn't it? That Jesus himself is the greater Bethel, the point of access between heaven and earth, the place where God's very presence, symbolized by the angels, is accessible to all. And in many ways, it's a question that our culture around us wrestles with. Uh, that actually, if there is a spiritual reality, uh, which a number of people think there is, then actually, how do we access it? How do we tap into it? Uh, where is our point of connection to it? 
And where do we see heaven opened? Is it through nature? Through that sense of awe you get as you see the sun rising or setting beautifully? Or maybe is it through meditation and mindfulness? Uh, through looking into yourself. Right? You only have to drive around East Auckland to see uh, half a dozen different places uh, offering meditation. Or maybe is it through Nirvana? Or through Muhammad? But actually, no, according to these verses, it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. But actually, if you want to get in touch with spiritual reality, uh, you need to get to know Jesus. Because heaven is open and ex- and accessible in Jesus, and heaven is closed and inaccessible apart from Jesus. So the public witness of this chapter is that Jesus himself is the fulfillment of the grand Old Testament hopes. Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is the very point of connection between heaven and earth. Well, as we come to a close... Now, one thing that struck me this past week uh, as I was working through these verses is that actually these patterns that we see here and the points that we've just covered, uh, in many ways, the more I thought about them, uh, the more I realized that actually they're my own experience. That actually they resonate with my own heart. And I suspect they resonate with many of your hearts too. That actually, for me, it was meeting Jesus that changed everything. It wasn't that I suddenly understood something. It wasn't a particular argument. No, it was meeting Jesus and getting to know him. And actually, the more I got to know him, the more I felt compelled that actually I had to try and tell other people. Often not very well. I'm missing far more opportunities than I ever took but feeling compelled that I've got to try and share them with other people. And actually, my own experience was that in meeting Jesus, I met God himself. That in and through Jesus, I know God. That God is accessible, and heaven is opened. You see, unlike my old acquaintance, John, Jesus isn't just a mad hatter with grandiose delusions, but actually, he's the real deal. That was the witness of John the Baptist. That was the witness of uh, all the people we've met in this chapter. And actually, that's the witness of millions of Christians all over the world today, including many of us here this morning. And so if any of you here or watching online uh, aren't persuaded, well, the invitation has been given. Come and see. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in the person of your Son. And Father, we openly confess that, uh, Lord, these are truths that we barely scratch the surface of. Uh, Lord, the staggering reality that you, the infinite God, would become a human being, take on human nature and walk among us. Father, we thank you that you indeed are the Messiah, the Son of God, and the King of Israel. And Lord, we pray for each one of us here this morning. And we pray, Lord, that we would know the Lord Jesus Christ, and not just from a distance, but know him personally and relationally, that we would come and see on a daily basis. And Father, that having found that, Jesus, you are all that you said you were and more, Uh, Lord, that you would give us the courage to be people who go and tell, uh, people who find others, people who try and share the gospel, however uh, awkwardly or uncomfortably. So, Father, come and work among us. And again, we thank you for your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.